Hello everyone, welcome inside the Pompidou Center. What a delight to join you virtually all over the world, wherever you're watching us from. Here, inside this pla beautiful place, this magical, legendary place, with Juliette Weir de la Rochefoucauld. We're ver here for a very specific reason today, because L'Ecole is sponsoring, as part of its great dedication to research, L'Ecole is sponsoring a Journée d'Etude, a day of study, about women and jewelry, women jewelers and abstraction. And Juliette, actually, tomorrow, will be one of the mm -hmm. teachers. Gisela is going to give you the link on the chat. There's no guarantee. It's free. It's first come for serve a maximum of 60 people but why not try uh, come and join Juliet and the other teachers tomorrow if possible as our continuing and longtime friends know and if you're joining us for the first time you're finding out the Ecole is incredibly dedicated to research. We support all sorts of research projects and this is just another chapter in the latest. There's another reason why we're here today, why we're going to be discussing women jewelers inside the Pompidou Center. There's a fantastic exhibition. Juliet and I have been mm -hmm. several times, mm -hmm. and we've drawn mm -hmm. inspiration for what we're going to talk about mm -hmm. today. It's called Elle Font l'Abstraction. Sign up. You need to reserve on the billetterie, on the, mm -hmm. on the ticket source. You have until August 23rd. Come one, come all. Share information because it is stupendous. It's enormous. It's it's beautiful and you must come and join. Well, today there's a translation, by the way, also. If you're on your computer and you're interested in having a simultaneous translation in Mandarin or in Cantonese, perhaps, then look for the little earth emoji on the bottom of your keyboard, click on that, and you'll have the option to have simultaneous translation. Otherwise, stay with us in English. And I think we're ready to get going. Yes, absolutely. We're talking about women jewelers. This is Juliette Weir de la Rochefoucauld, my dear friend. Another reason why it's such a blessing to be involved with a coal, special reason, is I get to <laughs> know and be friends with people like Juliet. That's a gift. Juliet is a fountain, a well, an encyclopedia of knowledge about jewelry. She shares with great passion what we're going to do today, we have an hour. So when you want to know more, we're going to give you sources to go further because mm -hmm. Juliet can share on and on and on. She is a very distinguished scholar and she, I've seen the organized and determined way she produces books. So watch for her next book because there seems to be a book a month from Juliet. <laughs> I'm Ayn Azita Gayekel. I think you, some of you know me. I'm a teacher at Lake Hole. I dedicate myself completely to Lake Hole. And one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about L'Ecole is the opportunity to bring you into places like the Pompidou and talk about women's jewelry. Mm -hmm. Let's get going, Julia. Okay, well, I'm delighted to be with you all. And um, we have chosen this first um, slide, which is a model wearing Marianne Ostier's jewelry. Marianne Ostier is an extraordinary woman from the uh, middle of the 20th century. She actually trained in Vienna and married Otto Olivier Ustreicher, um, as and with the Anschluss in 1938, she came over to New York and she built up her own business in New York. An extraordinary woman, tremendous energy. She had tremendous energy, and she here we see the model wearing lots of different pieces of jewelry um, by. Marianne Ostier, for instance, this, bra uh, this brooch um, on the choker is actually illustrated here, and it's an extraordinary piece. It's very three-dimensional, and this was somebody who was um, well known for her three-dimensional jewels. And one of the reasons I also chose her is because she was the very first person to be ever elected to the Diamond International Academy. That means that she was laureate five times in a row with the De Beers Diamond International Awards, which is an extraordinary feat. And of course, she won many other um, uh, jewelry awards as well. And um, so I think we need to just kick on from here. Definitely. Mm. It's, that's the thing. Today, we're going to divide our discussion up into three chapters. We respect the fact that people have busy lives. It's an hour. We can only touch. We will touch and sort of um, inspire you on some of the fantastic achievements of all this vast number of women jewelers who need to be recognized. And mm -hmm. we've chosen among some that are known and some mm -hmm. that are not so known, but we've chosen because of three aspects. Mm -hmm. Inspiration 
information and influencing? Where do the sources come from? How do they influence others? Who are the teachers and innovators and how do they innovate? And finally, what's happening in the world of jewelry today? Mm -hmm. What is, what are some of the latest picking and choosing, mm -hmm. cherry picking yes. for you to, to inspire you to go further mm -hmm. of the latest creators in ju women's mm -hmm. creating jewelry today? We cannot start without looking at Tiffany, at Lewis Comfort Tiffany and his interesting relationship with very strong women. Absolutely. I mean, this is the arts and crafts movement. It's the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, he was very keen in um, hiring young women who had just come from, uh, had just graduated from art school. And in this case, he hired Julia Munson in 1898. And um, she was to go on to become the head of the jewelry department in 1902 when uh, Louis Comfort Tiffany became the head of um, a creative director and they to, together they created 27 pieces of jewelry for the purchase exhibition in St. Louis, Louisiana um, and then from there on she went on to create many other pieces of jewelry and she was an enamelist herself um, and Meta Overberg took over from her in 1912 when um, Julia Munson actually uh, got married and Meta Munson was very well known for her choice of gemstones. She always used very different gemstones, for instance, yellow tourmaline, peridot. They were unusual stones at the time. Her rainbow of colors, mm. uh, Meta Overbeck's mm -hmm. rainbow of colors was extraordinary mm. and there's a quality that's American and yet completely in the American way synthesizing the Louisiana Absolutely. Purchase Exhibition mm. was a funny thing because it's it's an American celebration of identity and this is one mm. of the reasons why that partnership I mean we discussed Absolutely. that that in mm. um, Boston with yes. Emily Storer and mm. it's a subject mm -hmm. that needs to be gone much further but today yes. we're launching on into so we're full launching scale that. women jewelers so here we are with Marie Zimmerman who is probably one of the best known studio jewelries from the 1920s in the 1930s. Um, she was an extraordinary woman. She also um, made hollow wear. And so jewelry is just a small part of her, um, her wonderful um, uh, uh, repertoire. And she, and here we have uh, the ring, uh, her zircon ring on the left hand side, um, which is a beautiful, beautiful piece. And she's using her um, knowledge of archaeological digs. Um, and here we've got um, Egyptian um, iconic uh, motifs that she's using for this ring. And you can also see that she was a painter. She trained as a painter um, at the Art Students League of New York. And here we can see her use of color, you know, the enameling here. So we've got this wonderful orange, burnt orange enameling, which really takes up the reflections and the refractions within the gemstone itself. And then here on the left hand side, we have similar use of her knowledge for archaeological digs. And here again, we're using um, Egyptian icono iconological uh, motifs. And I think that you have something to say about that, don't you, well, uh, Anazita? What's really mm. phenomenal is that it's Egyptian revival, and yet it's not. It's, it's, it's heart and soul art deco. Mm. Also, it's timeless. It, it's that, and it's unique color palette that the women jewelers seem to in, have invented in America mm -hmm. in the first quarter of the 20th century. A vibrant, wild mm -hmm. color palette. Mm -hmm. But the actual papyrus motifs mm -hmm. are almost architectural. Mm -hmm. They're geometric, they're totally modern, and yet they're faithful to the spirit mm -hmm. of the ancient Egyptian. Just yeah. to give a tiny idea. Yeah. Now, just very quickly, in the center, we've got this wonderful, wonderful ring. And look at the structural um, uh, shank at the back. You know, it's almost like leather straps, but yet she's using uh, gold. And then we've got this wonderful sort of um, play of greens and pink sapphires here um, around this wonderful um, pearl in the center. This is typical of someone who is a painter, a colorist, who actually 
loves paint and knows how to use it. And, and from t from tiaras to tombstones is what absolutely, they said about Marie that's Zimmer, right. Which is why mm -hmm. she needs her own talk another that's time, right. perhaps with Emily Storer. But here but we go. Yes, we need to give credit to a Russian mm. lady. Yes, absolutely. Now Alma Pill was somebody who um, was hired by Fabergé when she was only 20 years old. Um, in actual fact, her father worked for Fabergé, and when he died, her uncle Albert Holstrom asked her to come in as a draftswoman and um, Albert Holstrom noticed how well she could draw and so when Dr. Emmanuel Nobel asked um, Ferberge to make 40 different jewels for his dinner guests which is rather nice I think yes. you know the idea that um, a nice uh, that there's a nice sort of rock crystal and diamond um, pendant that is there waiting for you as you um, uh, as you start dining um, but he didn't want something that was too expensive because he didn't want people to feel that he was trying to buy their favor and so she came up with these wonderful ice jewels which are very famous um, and she was inspired by the window panes in the workshop on a winter's morning um, when she could see the ice on window panes. In St. Petersburg, right? In St. Petersburg, now, yes, if we look absolutely. at a close-up of this piece on the left, if we were mm -hmm. to take, again, hide the date, play hide the date, that yeah. could be very rock and roll modern today, absolutely, this minute. Absolutely, absolutely. And this girl was a young girl at yes, that moment. Yes, she was. She's very young. And at the time, um, because she'd done such a good job with the 40 um, jewels, um, she was asked to design the winter egg for 1913, which was going to be given to the Dowager Empress Maria Fyodorovna, and um, she came up with this wonderful egg, which is actually um, carved on the outside and in, and carved on the inside, and on the on the base here we have this rock crystal stand, which really represents melting ice and I think anybody who is has been to Russia in spring understands the idea of melting ice everywhere you go um, and so this is what she came up with again with spring flowers which give an idea of the warmth of summer coming uh, to come. The basket is inside. Mm -hmm. Yes so that exactly that's right inside. absolutely and so here we have um, the nephrite leaves and the um, wonderful uh, flowers um, here the eglantine flowers here now in the center here this she was it was such a success that she was asked to make the next um, Easter egg and she was inspired by her mother's embroidery and as you can see when you go close up to it you can see the way that all the gemstones are set into a platinum mesh now I think that the, we recall of course La Cloche isn't that right um, who used um, platinum mesh for many of his pieces and I think you had something to say about well, that Ina Zita. Well as we were discussing mm -hmm. Juliet uh, La Cloche purchased mm -hmm. their design, their pieces, hundreds mm -hmm. of their pieces, when Fabergé had to leave Russia after the revolution. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was after the revolution that, that they probably got that inspiration. Yeah. But also, after the revolution, Alma Pill dedicated herself the rest of her life to teaching, didn't Absolutely. she? Absolutely. Um, she, never, she never went back to jewelry designing. She never talked about it either, according to her um, niece, um, Ulla Tillander Gudenheim, um, who's written a wonderful book. So um, you must, um, if you want to go further please uh, uh, buy that book. Now here we've got this wonderful person or wonderful jewelry house René Boivin and this is after the First World War. René Boivin actually um, was in existence before the First World War but here we're talking about the women in René Boivin and Jeanne Boivin took over the management and the direction of René Boivin when um, René Boivin unfortunately died in 1917 and then her son died in the subsequent year as well. Um, and she hired the wonderfully famous um, Suzanne Belperon, who we'll see later on, um, in 1919. And when she left in 1932, Juliette Moutard came to join uh, Jeanne Boivin and um, Juliette Moutard 
um, stayed with René Boivin for 40 years. So it was a very long time that she was with René Boivin. And she took all her inspiration from um, uh, visits to the Louvre and to other museums. And um, Marie-Caroline de Brosse, who was a f personal friend, um, came in as uh, the creative director in 1970. And what's interesting, she told me this story about the cat core ring. And the cat core ring, which is an iconic piece for René Boivin. And um, she said that uh, Juliette Moutard found four lines of this fish scale bracelet on the left, but which was set with uh, blue sapphires at the time, and that she was just playing around with it. And she thought that looked like a very nice ring. And so she, um, she sent it to the workshop and got the workshop to put an interesting shank on at the, at the, uh, at the back. And of course, all, this, all the gemstones move. And so it's a wonderful piece. And it's been made with all sorts of different gemstones. Now, Marie-Caroline uh, de Bros also told me about this wonderful um, shrimp uh, brooch which she um, was uh, which she made and she was inspired by a shrimp lunch which she was having with a friend which was quite amazing the idea of um, transforming a shrimp into a brooch I think what it shows is that all th all these ladies who worked with Bavan mm -hmm. took inspiration from everywhere starting Absolutely. very young and being mm -hmm. very 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 free and open and mm -hmm. I think a perfect example mm -hmm. of that is the joy and the fun and the preciousness of the fact that you were given these That's pictures right, yes. by her children. Yes, absolutely. Her children contacted me when they knew that we were going to be doing this webinar. And um, here we have a pendant and a ring. And Marie-Caroline de Brosse continued on when she left Boivin as MCB. And a lot of her jewels are now coming up at auction. Um, but she loved playing with wood. And so she used um, amarant, Kenwood, sycamore wood. Um, and all sorts of different styles of wood um, to create her wonderfully fun, summery style jewels. As we're going into summer, and mm -hmm. this is so modern, this is years and years ago, Absolutely. but it's the moment now with mm -hmm. our hope and our mm -hmm. wanting to look toward the future. We mm -hmm. live in an Instagram world. We live in yeah. a world where people are online mm -hmm. with us virtually from home. But in the time when these ladies were creating jewelry, black and white photography was and the, the phenomenon of mm -hmm. fashion magazines Absolutely. was taking Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. Twitter, everything and slamming it into one and, and to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to take a moment to look at some of the legendary fashion photographers to show you how their work with the images of the jewels that these ladies created were very powerful. Absolutely. And you can see here um, George Hunigan Hunner and his student Horse P. Horse who became as um, famous as uh, um, George, um, Hoonigan and Huna. Um, we see their photographs here and we can see how the women wore their jewellery and this is terribly important because it helps us know how um, the jewels were worn and it helps us also look at the jewels and see how we can perhaps vary them, make them slightly different and wear them differently. And so here we have this wonderful um, piece which is by Suzanne Belperron which is in carved uh, calcet and it's a wonderful um, uh, classical uh, clip um, but very discreet but very elegant. There's a couple of things that are stunning which is that she was such a colorist and yet the piece looks so great in black mm -hmm. and white mm -hmm. and that black and white could be so powerful even with color. Of course it had a great influence on making people have a hunger for yeah. white mm -hmm. jewels. Absolutely. Now Suzanne Belperon, she used anything, um, any jewel, any jewel, any um, gemstone. Because, yeah, people um, might be guessing, what is this? Yes. Are people guessing, is that jade, mm -hmm. is it turquoise? Yes, exactly. What is it, Julia? This is actually just paste, and um, but she used paste, she could use um, all sorts of different types of gemstones to create her vision, and it was her vision that was the most important thing. And so here she's um, using a paste 
to represent, I suppose we would think, uh, Jade, but she didn't care about that. The idea was just the piece itself. And then she also had this wonderfully long uh, collaboration with Adrienne Loire, huh, who was a lapidary in Paris at the time. And throughout both of their careers, they worked um, alongside each other uh, for many, many pieces. And here we see this wonderful pair of earrings, which are sold at Agut uh, here in Paris. And you can see that she, uh, he has cut the rock crystal and it has been um, frosted uh, to create this wonderful um, uh, bell-like uh, pendant earring. And in the enlargement, it's even more stunning. Those are natural mm. pearls. That's right. It's, it's re Absolutely almost ridiculous incredible. how yeah. perfect they are. And the date, mm -hmm. so, so modern. Yeah, and, 1935. And the, and the link necklace was 1936. You can see it here um, in the photograph. And then what about the lower left part? And the brooch here is made of, of a set of gemstones, mainly pink sapphires, topaz, ruby, and they're all with very, very um, colored um, cuts, all sorts of different cuts. Her whole idea was to mix the cuts together to create something new and to create a new dynamic. And you can see by just putting one or two touches of green emerald, it changes the whole, I, whole feel of the piece. So we get the atmosphere of the piece. Don't you think, Juliet, this is a very appropriate piece in the abstraction environment and with the seminar yes absolutely, absolutely because it's an assemblage it could be Frankenthaler yes it could be it could Frankenthaler be. in her color face absolutely uh, and it's uh, these geometric assemblages mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm, brilliant mm -hmm, personage mm -hmm. created yes but um, here we have again Adrian Loire helping uh, to create these wonderful camellia rock crystal camellias and these are a set of five uh, brooches and here we have them set with rubies and diamonds and they're really exquisite they are varying sizes as you can see and then over here in the center now this is something that I always like to try and point out is that very often we have interesting designs which we feel we know where that comes from we've seen it we've seen it over and over again but suddenly somebody has had to design it and very often we don't know where that design came from. And this is exactly what we've got here with the yin and yang engagement ring, which uh, Suzanne Belperon designed for herself. She designed this in 1923. That is nearly a hundred years ago. And it's as modern today as it was then. We it's have, extraordinary. You know, Julian and I have been playing this hide the date game. Yeah. Because if we hid <laughs> the date on that, who mm -hmm. on earth would ever say 1923? You might say the 70s. You yes, might. absolutely. But, and then, same thing with this portrait of her. We this is a beautiful love portrait. the portrait because She's let's very sophisticated. And let's zero in. Yes. Process. Absolutely. Stone papers. Yes. Designs. Mm -hmm. Tools. Mm -hmm. So. And look. And sorry. And no. look here. You've got this wonderfully famous parour, um, which uh, Suzanne Belperon made. And so you know you can find that in the various different books on Suzanne Belperon. It's a very famous piece. I mean the face and the reflection could be Angler, mm -hmm. it could be a Hollywood movie yeah. star, mm -hmm. but Absolutely. the point of it yeah. is the transversality of mm -hmm. process. Now that is now. Mm -hmm. Nobody yes. thought about that before. Just an example and we 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 want to push forward some of these some of these amazing people that you can find in Juliet's book and other places. We hope you'll be inspired to keep going. Mm -hmm. We cannot not give a moment to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Tresco, especially those of you who know how obsessed I am with medieval and ancient. Juliet has done research into how this fantastic woman, Elizabeth Tresco, brought back history, but then made mm -hmm. something as totally modern as that. Well, exa exactly. I mean, here's Elizabeth Tresco. She was passionate about um, the ancient times, she was passionate about archaeological digs and she actually came to Paris in the early 1920s and visited Musée Cluny um, where she saw a lot of medieval uh, works of art and this really changed her focus when she went back uh, to Germany and she started um, collecting medieval pieces which are now um, you, you can now view them in the uh, museum of applied arts in um, Cologne. But she was also very well known for actually rediscovering uh, granulation. Now this is, uh, you know, 
Castellani um, in the 19th century rediscovered um, our granulation um, and also um, various different people in the 20th century did as well. However, she decided to try and use the Etruscan method to, for granulation, which was filing gold and covering it in charcoal and then fusing those um, gold filings, fusing them with either uh, cow glue or fish glue um, onto the surface. And um, here we have some of her great, uh, her great examples or works of art. And here we've got, it's a cabochon orange sapphire, which is an extraordinary um, gemstone in itself. You know, it's a beautiful piece. And then on the left-hand side, um, we have this extraordinary pendant um, which uh, Ina Zita actually asked me to um, uh, show because it's got this wonderful feel of the medieval times. It could be ancient Greek, it yeah. could be medieval, mm -hmm. it's the use of the Baroque pearl but it's also irreversibly modern that yeah. abstract mm -hmm. way that the that the curls totally, are done totally, of the fur totally. this lady taught also and she yes, won that right. great award and she was, she was extraordinary because um, she taught from 1948 onwards until her retirement in 1964 um, but she also won the gold medal in the 1936 uh, Trian Trianale in Milan and then she also won a gold medal at the Parisian University exhibition you know these are we forget about her 1937 exactly. which is as the war clouds were absolutely gathering, absolutely it, it, a lot was happening in modernity mm -hmm. which had to wait until after totally the war. totally <coughs> so uh, Elizabeth Tresco is a perfect transition into our chapter about teachers and investigators because they're all teachers and investigators mm -hmm. but when we say investigator we need to stop and look at Lean Vautrin because here's a Absolutely. lady who investigated and innovated during mm -hmm. very sad mm -hmm. times in Paris yes. and never used precious gold although if you go and try to buy her pieces right now from the prices, it's precious. It's they precious are. art very jewelry expensive. that doesn't mm -hmm. use gold. Absolutely. Um, and she was somebody that during the war, people may not have been able to buy an outfit, but they were able to perhaps buy a little trinket. And that's what they would be able to do with uh, Lean Vautrin's jewels. Uh, they could buy a trinket just to um, brighten their outfit. And she actually employed 40 people during the, the Second World World War, extraordinary feat. Um, and she also exposed at the Parisian Universal Exhibition. And um, she made these wonderful necklaces on the on the right hand side. And this is something that people don't necessarily know about her, and I this is why I'd like to highlight it. She had a wonderful way of creating different types of links and fantasy links for her necklaces, and even using children's nursery rhymes like Le Ferret. Il court, il court le ferret. The ferret, he runs, he runs. And here we've got a dachshund which is running around in, uh, after his friend, I suppose. Um, I think a part of that too was humor during the war and mm. after. And, uh, and some of it was even protest resistance jewelry. But yes. there also was mm -hmm. just fantasy and mm -hmm. fun. And she was also a great investigator. She was yeah. somebody who um, used sheets of cellulose acetate and she would scour these sheets and uh, using um, a gas heated um, iron and she would carve and form the cellulose acetate as she wanted and she called it her talucel. Um, uh, and so here we have her use of talucel um, and little small pieces of glass which were treated with mercury silver, which of course is no longer legal today. But at the time, um, this is what she was used and she used it for its iridescence. And so we get this wonderful sort of feel um, for this uh, necklace which is called Marie Antoinette. It's a very grand necklace, even if it's not made in um, gold or or in platinum um, and of course most of you will know about her mirrors which go for fortunes nowadays and she was somebody who also taught the next generation of people to use Talucel um, and she was able to um, uh, really bring on uh, the next generation of young women um, who really were looking for something to, uh, to do 
um, other than staying at home or being in the office. At one point she had 40 people she was training and worked for her That's in the Marais, absolutely, correct? Yes, in the Marais absolutely. in Paris. Yes, in the, and during she the Second World War. fun rebuses like yes. her name. Uh, yes, the, the that's interesting, her name and she, a lot of her pieces we call her a poet really because instead of using gemstones she used words and she used a lot of features from the architecture in Paris and also um, ancient stories like um, Zeus's daughters were transformed and into a bracelet. And, and her some little of those were resistance stories. Absolutely, definitely. yes. yes. And she them. also used, um, she, she'd sign her pieces, in, in particular her mirrors, she'd sign them with L-I, and then underneath L-I there would be the image of a calf, which in French means veau, and then underneath that there would be a line, a train with a line of carriages behind it for train. So in which would in French would be train. So li, vo, train. So voilà. lots of fun. <laughs> lots of fun. And of course, when we want to talk about someone who taught, since this is our chapter on teaching, it's maybe our most important person. My yes, this lady, absolutely. Don't you think? Margaret Craver was a huge influence in America um, in the 1940s and the 50s. And in actual fact, she graduated from the University of Canvas and she was always interested in jewelry and she always felt she couldn't find a course that she could that she could really learn about metalsmithing from. So she went to Sweden and she learned metalsmithing from Baron Eric Fleming, who was this uh, court silversmith for the Swedish um, royal family. And then she came back and she instantly started giving courses to people to teach them what she had learned herself. She was also um, a silversmith as well as a jeweler. And at the same time, she was a volunteer, she was a volunteer nurse. And throughout the In World War II. Uh, yes, and throughout the Second World War, um, she worked in a naval hospital. And and while she was there, she saw that the repetitive motions that you need as a goldsmith could actually help a lot of the wounded soldiers uh, to improve their own dexterity and their own, um, their own ability to move their uh, upper limbs. And so she, with um, the metal refiners Handy and Harmon, she actually set up a course for occupational therapists to teach them how to help these uh, wounded soldiers and it was a course that became almost um, uh, the uh, sort of almost, de rigueur, yes, right? Yes, exactly, de rigueur. You must um, take it. It really were for anybody who wanted to get a job in metal smithing in any way in America at that time. Including lots of women. Absolutely. Now she was also a great investigator and she investigated the new uh, the 17th century technique of en résil, which had been lost again. It had come back in the 19th century and we see that in England. But she rediscovered the techniques and again the en résil enameling is for uh, placing on gold, uh, on um, uh, excuse me, on glass and not on metal. And so here she engraves the shapes that she wants, and then she places a very, very thin foil of gold. And within the foil of gold, she places the enamel powder. And it's through that enamel powder, which she fires, that you get these wonderful sort of um, drops of oil, as Susie Menkes once uh, mentioned. So here we um, are. Is a complete yeah. abstract work of art, conceptual Absolutely. work of art yes. that's also incarnating ancient techniques brought back to life, mm. brought, taught by a lady who shares with everyone, including yeah. injured veterans. Mm -hmm. She might be our star of the whole discussion yes, today. Yes, exactly. However, however coming back to Europe, yes. we have Gerda Flockinger, and Gerda Flockinger um, uh, actually emigrated from Austria to England, and she actually went to um, St. Martin's School of Art, and she trained as a painter, and in 1951, she came to Paris and she was very influenced by Jean Fouquet's jewelry. And she, when she went back to London, she saw an exhibition on contemporary jewelry at the Central School of Art and Crafts, which influenced her as well. And so she decided to take a course at the Central School, which she did. And what's interesting here was this was at a time when there was a lot of reform happening within the school. And um, 
uh, young artists had been introduced as teachers to the jewelers to actually help them understand about the grammar of design and to understand about creativity as well as the techniques that they needed to create um, beautiful jewels. And this was something that Gerda took to heart and she herself actually set up a course at the Hornsey uh, um, School of Art in 1962 and she continued teaching this course all the way through the 1960s until 1967, 1968. And it became the um, uh, uh, iconic uh, course to do for jewellery designers of the time. She was also really interested, one of the reasons we brought in photography earlier on is because it was such an exciting time and it was at a time when we had um, micro photography and also speed photography and Flockinger was interested in both and you can see here with the milk coronet splash so by Harold Edgerton. This is just one splash of milk? Yes, that's micro one splash of milk. Can you imagine? And you know she uses that and you can see see from the ring on the left hand side there are sort of little ideas um, from that um, but also she was somebody who created this one she was very well right that's hands. right yes and um, she was also somebody who um, used fusion she investigated fusion she decided how far could she go with fusion of metals and it was almost like taking gold dust and building the gold dust up layer upon layer a bit like an oil painting now, that you do this one on the lower right is the one you're talking about, right? Yes. And that's silver and, also, and gold. This is silver and gold. And the whole idea was that she would um, build the layers up through fruit fusion. And it was a bit like an oil painting, you know, as an, as an oil painter would do with layers of um, brush strokes. The exact same w would happen with her method for um, creating these wonderful fusion um, style net, uh, jewels and here we've got another one which is extraordinary um, this is what she called her sleeve ring and she was um, very much uh, at the forefront of investigation and discovery at the time and she is of course I one of our great dams of um, jewelry in Great Britain. Did you say she was dripping bits of gold on no, this? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying that she was building it up with building gold up. dust. Building it up with gold dust and melting yeah. it. Yeah. Fantastic. And this is a, a long Fusing it, ring. fusing it, not melting it. Fusing, oh, yes. it. fusing it together mm -hmm. and it, with an opal. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Now here... We here um, we've got Nana Dietzel. Now Nana Dietzel is another person who I love and Ina Zita was sort of musing earlier on about um, inspiration and influences um, and this is very interesting because again as I was saying earlier on we don't know where some of these designs which we see all the time and this egg chair for instance which we all know of it was designed by Nana Dietzel and her husband Jorgen Dietzel and this chair was inspired by the scallop pendant necklace which was made a little earlier on. Um, now Nana Dietzel and Jorgen Dietzel, they were both, both trained as furniture designers and um, when she moved into jewellery she always kept on designing furniture um, and when she moved into jewellery her first, um, her first medal or first prize was one under the name of Anton Mitchelson who was the court jeweler of the time for the Danish um, uh, royal family. But so what's fantastic is this transversality like a Jean Dunant mm -hmm. for example that architecture, mm -hmm. chairs, mm -hmm. uh, jewels they're all transversal creations of art. For instance yeah. this Trinidad chair mm -hmm. influenced what? Yes, it's extraordinary. This Trinidad chair influenced this great um, bracelet here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not even showing it to you. Here we go, here. Um, and it was from the Caribbean architecture and from shutters and grates, which you can find over there. And it's really, if you look very carefully, it's to do with the, with the shadows. And what you have with her work, her work is very much about the shadows and the reflection and the light. Um, and all her jewels, you will always see shadows and the play of shadows on her pieces. And interestingly enough, she won um, 
the silver medal at the Triennale in 1957 and she also won the gold medal at the Triennale in 1960. She was an extraordinary talented woman and also in synergy with her husband who unfortunately died at the turn of the 1960s which is um, uh, a very sad occurrence. Juliet and I were both playing a game this yeah. morning of, of looking at Nana in her own bracelet. That's right, exactly. <coughs> which we put on our Instagram because and these pieces are meant to be worn. As beautiful as it is as an art object mm -hmm. on the table and when we look at this blown up it is truly an art object but when it's on the woman. Absolutely, it's, it's beautiful. This really is abstract beautiful. art which yes. also becomes a part of the force of that, of that woman. Don't you agree? Absolutely, I totally agree. And for those who know her work, um, the scallop, uh, the muscle brooch was inspired by the odor chair. And I'm just putting that out there so you can go out and look, at, look for the odor chair. Now when we talk about people who everything mm. about their life, even what mm -hmm. they did as a child, even their emotions that they feel when they listen to music, mm -hmm. we come to this lady, don't we? Yes. Now Viviana Turon Bulo Uber. <laughs> um, she's somebody, she's an extraordinary person. She's very well known. She lived in France, she lived in Paris, she lived in Biot. Um, and when she was a child, um, she skated every day in winter and in, she would talk about the difficulty of balance and the changing of the edges of, her, of the blades of her skates as she was making her, mo uh, her movements and formations. And here we can see that very easily here in this, these contemporary rings from earlier designs. The lily pad ring here and then we've got the Mobius Mobius ring here which is all from one strip of metal and then we have the Mobius strip ring and then here we've got the one in two um, ring which is really made from a formation of eight which of course comes also from her skating days. But music was and a big part of her life too, absolutely. right? Absolutely. Music was a big part of her life especially when she was married to her third husband um, Walter Coleman who was a painter and when they were living in Paris they very much frequented the jazz scene and here we see uh, Billie Holiday wearing her pieces at the famous 1950 57 um, concert. And please note that comb on the back of oh, her yes, head. Oh yes, absolutely. The, so the, comb. the totally abstract tiara comb yeah. pushed to mm -hmm. the back like they did in the totally, 19th century. Totally. And mm -hmm. then with the ponytail, mm -hmm. it's just yes. Billie Holiday at her absolute best. Absolutely. And now, one, sorry, just very quickly, um, I need, just need to very quickly say the Looning Prize um, was won for this mobile necklace. Again, it's one strip of metal um, and it's in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in, uh, in Paris. Oh, it's here in Paris? Yes. Oh, that's great. So one example is there. So let's move on because we're... And now here we've got Margaret de Pata, and Margaret de Pata is probably one of the great jewelers of the, mi of the mid 20th century. She was very much influenced by Maholi Naja, um, who was a Bauhaus light, um, who came over to the United States. And uh, they met when he was giving a summer course at the Mills College, Oakland in California. And he was very interested and he was experimenting at the time about different transparencies and light on uh, photosensitive paper and here we see um, Margaret de Pata was doing exactly the same thing but with gemstones and we can see this here she was using her gemstones and cutting the facets in different ways to create um, all sorts of different illusions and we see that here and she was also very interested in texture and we see that with the matte against the shiny and um, now she was one who had that same kind of partnership with her lapidaries that Suzanne Belperon had, correct? So she would really sit and work with the lapidaries to absolutely, develop Absolutely, absolutely. She would carve her, uh, her cuts in wood first and in then hand them on. First. Yes, and then hand them on to Frances Sperrison who was her lapidary of the time. Even this piece? Yes. Wasn't it Maholi Nagy who said leave your stones free? Oh yes. So I mean this me, is even this though is this piece is mounted, of course, but yeah. it is freeing the stones That's right. to float and move. I mean, I just need to say, uh, quote it to you. Catch your stones in the air, make them float, don't enclose them. I mean, it's just a wonderful phrase. And that's it really this piece is right beautiful. here. I think this piece yeah. completely incarnates that. Absolutely. Now, a lady who, well, 
she needs not just yeah. she needs her own course absolutely not course Wendy Ramshaw is another of the great dams of great British um, jewelry um, she actually started out as an industrial designer she trained as an industrial designer and then trained as a teacher and she has always looked to the future she's always looked at different um, materials and here we've got the petrified lace necklace which is a very late piece in 2010 um, and it's made of nano crystalline diamond coated steel which is normally used um, for hip replacements and she's used it here to create this wonderful um, necklace and then on the right hand side we've got this medal which she was commissioned to make for Queen Elizabeth II for the millennium and again we're using nano crystalline diamond and also Zeridor and Zeridor is a type of transparent ceramic so she was really at the forefront of what was happening and like Marie Zimmerman she also made gates and not just small jewels <laughs> but gates and this one is so and architectural this looks like a absolutely, bridge too it looks absolutely like it's modern it's architectural that's it's right she was somebody who actually um stupefied. she was she was influenced by her father and her grandfather who were in the shipbuilding business and um she always said that it it seemed like um maps that you know she was a lot of her in, uh, inspiration came from maps and she gave the jewel mm -hmm. the place of art we wanted to always right. have which is as a work of art that can be worn Absolutely. and played with and to never forget with. the mm -hmm. idea that it is worn and played with but when you're not wearing mm -hmm. it what can it do yes well here this this is an iconic part of her work is that she created these wonderful pillar sets or ring sets and the idea is that anybody could put the rings on in any different order they liked but when they weren't wearing them they would be placed on a pillar and the pillars were made out of nickel alloys, aluminium, um, acrylic perspex and she got this idea from using a lathe at the beginning and then from there she she started experimenting with different metals but I believe this one if, if it looks like a chess piece to you that's not by accident because no. I think this one's called the red queen yes that is and, that's and, so and then these cabochons mm -hmm. and the use of the cabochons is almost medieval it's timeless mm -hmm. very yeah. modern but mm -hmm. very ancient mm -hmm. too she had a wonderful sense of um, playing with installations when she was showing her jewelry in a gallery for instance she would um, have an installation and so many of her installations for instance would have been the White Queen or Prospero's Table or Room of Dreams all these um, are, are well documented on the internet so you would be able to find them if you wanted to go further with this uh, we mm. could just go um, on and on yes, with Wendy exactly. Ramshaw, she's amazing, she's amazing. Back to America, to um, a true Renaissance lady, who absolutely. is like today's, today's women mm -hmm. feel just as comfortable being strong and feminist, writing a cookbook or cooking at home as they do forging jewelry like Barbara mm -hmm. Anton did both yes. and everything. I mean, Barbara Anton was extraordinary. She trained as an engineer first of all and then she trained as a painter and then she wrote and cookbooks and then she wrote cookbooks why not yes and in between all that <laughs> she created the most wonderful pieces of jewelry and she won 23 international jewelry awards particularly, in particularly with pearls, with right? pearls. Right. and here I use this piece because she's from the 19, 1960s early 1970s and she's using gold in the same way as Andrew Grima was using it Arthur King was using it Jean Vendôme as well was using it so it was very much of a style of the time and he, here's this a stunning stunning piece and you can see how it is being worn on the right on the right hand side sorry here if you're in Europe, mm. the, the Kim Klosterman collection mm. from which this necklace comes, mm. dear friend of the school, mm -hmm. is at the Schmuck Museum, excuse my pronunciation, yes. in Fortsheim. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you can go and see it if you're in yes. Europe. Mm -hmm. Try to. Please do. Third chapter. Forging yes. new pathways. So who is building the future? Who is forging the future? Well, we ha have to start with um, Elsa Peretti. Elsa Peretti um, came onto the scene in the early 1970s and she brought in simplicity to jewelry. And you, and actually, the legend that she is, you actually talked to her. Oh, yes. And I you can share some I of I had some won uh, wonderful conversations with Elsa over the time that I needed to write the chapter on her. In your book. And... Um, um, you know, one thing she always, always underlined, uh, I said, I am not an artist, I am a craftswoman. And that was something that she was very, very um, uh, 
uh, adamant that I should put that forward, that she is a craftswoman. Woman. And as she said, you know, she worked um, creating her very simple um, shapes, which was very difficult to do. I mean, they're simple, but they took her weeks and weeks, months and months to actually get the right shape, the right curves, the right angle to each piece and the right size. That teardrop, um, right? That's right, that, that teardrop. teardrop. Seems so simple. Absolutely, but it took a long Laborious. time to get the right um, shape and the shape that she wanted. And the same with the um, uh, heart, which is on the uh, cover of Newsweek, which was um, really celebrating her new style of jewellery, um, where she was bringing back simplicity and she was also um, bringing back silver. She made silver trendy again, and what was fashionable it her, again. What was it that her friend Halston told her? And Halston was a great, great friend of Elsa Peretti's. And Halston always said, one, never sell your name, two, always make things in small, medium, and large. I love that. And it's just what she does with and Tiffany's. And it worked. It yes, definitely absolutely worked. does. And she had this wonderful um, uh, relationship with Hero, the photographer, Sorry. which you saw earlier on. Um, there. Sorry, I, I'll go back. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, she was probably one of the first people to create a, a type of atmosphere around her pieces of jewellery. And you see this here, and I've used this image of um, the drop really because it's not as well known as some of the other hero uh, um, pieces. And before we go on to Bina Gunka, who works so with mesh, yes. I automatically advance, we need to think about Elsa Peretti and the mesh bra. Yes, and now um, she actually was inspired to make this mesh bra when she was in um, Rajasthan in India um, in 1975 and when she came back to the United States she was looking um, for a way to continue making mesh bras and so with a friend um, she discovered that there was an old factory that was about to close called Whiting and Davis and she was able to find an ex-employee who was over 80 years old who was able to show her how to use the machines and these machines had been used at the turn of the century to make mesh handbags and so um, she got there just in time and they were able to buy up all the machines to create these wonderful pieces. What a story and it's that tra craftsmanship, that respect yeah, for yeah. craftsmanship. Now Bina Absolutely. Gunka now, in India mm, has that respect that's and right. keeps it. And Bina Gunka um, from, um, from Mumbai, she has this wonderful respect for the savoir-faire and handmade and anybody who comes to her work in her workshop they spend the first one to two years actually making these tiny little links to create this mesh. And this, I've seen this and I've worn it, and it's like silk. It's extraordinary. And her, her idea is to actually one day create a sari just in um, a gold link. I think, I think she and Giovanni mm -hmm. Corvaja are destined to meet. Absolutely, and work I do think so. And, and she's amazing because she pearls. specializes in pearls and she makes a lot of very interesting pieces of jewelry, very contemporary in feel, with just a little Indian flavor. For to um, me, both. I think it's very yeah. fair to mm -hmm. the Indian tradition. I'm obsessed with the Indian tradition. Absolutely. And it's the sculptural use that the exquisite kind of floral and yet ultimately modern and the more we expand this picture yes the more abstract once again absolutely we're in an abstraction. It, absolutely now um, we cannot everything's back stop here. if we choose someone French and Renaissance and everything and you wrote a book about her yes absolutely I mean Lydia Corte um, she has just got the most extraordinary imagination she started out, she started out as a biochemist and she worked as a biochemist for just a biochemist year, yes, why not um, <laughs> for 10 years and then by sheer chance she turned her hand to becoming an antique dealer and at first she started using intaglios old gemstones and old cameos creating these large cocktail rings and then she just went on and she every collection is different all the gemstones that she uses are so different there's phosphosiderite which is a fluorescent pink color and then here we've got sunstone or this brown uh, moonstone it's extraordinary what she uses this was um, her tri this was her native american is this is her native american collection the rainbow warrior collection rainbow warrior i love yeah. that and i love and this you, photo and if you look <laughs> at the this earring she's actually wearing it here 
which is lovely. Yes. And then here, and then again, she's got her tribal African collection, which she adds to all the time. And this um, is very much to do with carving and um, um, cultural references. And talk about a very beautiful, powerful, absolutely. feminine force. Absolutely. I think it's perfect also mm -hmm. for our discussion of but women's you, jewelry. But Lydia is mm. somebody who has, um, she's been, she's really the do or doyen of modern jewelry um, as we see it today. Of course, mm -hmm. when you speak of modern jewelry, when you speak of yes, the, the old the ways, the mm -hmm. old respect, the slow jewelry, as she calls it, mm -hmm. and also the exquisite stones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Michel Ong of Carney, um, uh, she creates these exquisite pieces of jewelry with her partner, Avi Nagar, and um, she has always used rose diamonds, for instance, here. And she had a wonderful saying. She just said, they have a purity of form and light that fascinates me. A beautiful glow-like light diffusing through the clearest water. It's but just a wonderful, wonderful saying. But this acorn uh, yes. piece, when we zero in on it, they're rose cuts, yes. but they're all cut specifically to look like acorns and Absolutely. to work in the leaves. And yes. then the way she makes the metal recede. What is That's she doing right. to that? She's well, she's oxidizing yes. the, the, the metal. And then brown diamonds. And then with brown diamonds. She loves brown diamonds. And she's also somebody who um, is fascinated with textiles and and so many of her pieces actually originate are inspired by lace for instance and then this wonderful wonderful piece took over two years to make and it's got all the different color variations of uh, jade um, all carved as goods which is a very auspicious symbol in China in um, Chinese culture I'm sure you all know that um, and each one is set using gold and titanium and uh, Michelle Ong is very, very interesting when she uses her titanium. Sometimes the titanium is used to complement the gemstones as we see here and sometimes it's used to contrast. So the titanium here is actually blue in color against the green of the gemstones. It's a very stunning, Fantastic. stunning piece. Yeah, you think those are gems mm -hmm. but that's actually mm -hmm. the titanium. Yeah. And then there's purple against the purple. Mm -hmm. And then she's got this rainbow graduation of Absolutely. very precious jade. So this yeah. is a whole and rainbow. You know, of so what she was saying is that that, um, you know, because it took two years, she says to work with care means he doesn't work fast. Mm. And that's really why we call it slow jewelry, is because to make something beautiful, you have to take your time. It's not about doing it quickly really important. Now this lady takes her time with her clients. She has a great uh, synergy and Absolutely. Sort of the Alexandra Moore, I love her work. It's very simple, very architectural in style. Here she's using a green Peruvian opal um, and her work started out being um, about diamond melee, um, set and knife edge, but in actual fact um, she's gone on to work with Tagua seeds um, as a botanical replacement to elephant ivory for instance. Yes, and Tagua she's seeds are, we use them mm. at Lecol oh, yeah, actually, goodness. in the Japanese lacquer. Oh, that's really sure. interesting. It's, it's something to really... Yeah. It really should be supported. It's exquisite carving material. Beautiful, absolutely. And she spent a lot of time in Bali um, working with the artisans to actually um, perfect the, the method to create her collections in Tagua seeds. But for her, it's all about mindfulness, about where she sources her gemstones, which is terribly important. And as she says, um, when she's talking to a client, it's about embodying the individu individuality of the collector and it has to be a unique and personal process. So again, it takes time. So if we talk about someone who is unique in every aspect of her work and who is totally French and draws on all the French savoir-faire, Yes, having said that, we have these wonderful sort of um, yeah. uh, mobile earrings which are of Mount Fuji in Japan <laughs> um, on one side. But that's very French to do but that. They, yes, absolutely. Totally agree with you. And here she always commented that she found that um, any of the great masters from uh, Japanese art, she, f she found that Mount Fuji was always in the clouds, always in, on the snow, or it was in the rain. But, and so as a result, her earrings here, so we have the pair of earrings here, 
Sylvie um, Corbelage. Sylvie Corbelage. With quite, her with her ruy clouds. Yes. And then the snake. She loves yes. snakes. She and sees the positive of snakes. Is that correct? Yes, she loves snakes. Snakes are kind. Snakes are a beautiful, uh, beautiful being. And um, in actual fact, um, what she loves uh-huh. about them <laughs> is that they shed their skin to grow. And she feels that we as people, we should be shedding our baggage so that we are growing as well. And so here we have another piece here down here, which is called the Telem Ring. And this is, uh, takes after um, the Picassiet, uh, the idea that you take broken crockery and you create a mosaic with it. And here she's creating a mosaic with her opals. This is the one that makes me think of French savoir-faire because without French jewelers that we have here in Paris, nobody could put together such a work of art yes. that is also quite conceptual. Yeah. Um, now, Monique Payon, um, we need to go quickly here, but I really need to talk to you about her work. She's somebody who lost her sister and as a result really sort of had a look at um, what life really meant. And she felt that um, life is about not how long you live, but it's about um, how you interact with other people. And she was on a scientific, and she works with um, fossilized dinosaur bone and meteorites. And here we have um, a journey that she made on the glaciers um, in Antarctica uh, with a scientific um, uh, expedition. And she also equated this with this vertebrae of an H. Geosaurus um, uh, here and you can actually see just the the way that is fossilized is very similar to the um, global warming uh, conditions of the glacier so the sort here. Of fissures absolutely, that are happening. And absolutely. she said she could hear the glacier as it was melting. That's right, it's the carving like like of the glacier and you know it's called and the the vertebrae is pyrotized so it has this wonderful shimmering which you also get off the glacier so it's really important to say that. And uh, another example, this is one of her earliest pieces, correct? This is one of her earliest pieces up in Alaska. And um, she was with an Inuit community. And what surprised her was just the number of piles of fossilized walrus bone that she was finding. And um, uh, the Inuits told her that because of global warming, many of these bones were coming up to the surface um, again. And So so as a result, she... So Actually, they're doing their scrimshaw on these fossilized right, yes. bones. And so she asked some of the artisans to do that for her. And look at how abstract that is, but it's know, Inuit art. It is. It's extraordinary. And then this bracelet here is made up of fossilized dinosaur bone from the Colorado Plateau and also sapphire um, crystals here. And then, of course, we just... Gl- push this one in because um, uh, Biden's wife is actually wearing um, Monique Payon's um, earrings which are hexagonal in shape and um, those are um, inspired by the Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland and that really is a bit of a, um, a clan day for me because I'm Irish. And well, also that this lady mm, gives back. She mm, supports education. Absolutely, she does. She supports mm, everything. Yeah. Now, a, a woman who is a fearless and who fearlessly embarked on a journey against the wishes of her parents and created something forever in the Smithsonian. Yes, absolutely, is the royal butterfly, Cindy Chow. And she cre- she started off, and this is something that perhaps many of you um, as jewelry designers um, are starting out and you haven't actually got the contacts, you don't know who to go to, the, the workshops to go to, who to contact. Well, she, this, she was in the same position and she actually found by herself all the different contacts and she just telephoned. She took a telephone and she telephoned Christie's and then she telephoned Bergdorf Goodman. Each one gave her the possibility to come and show her jewels for about 20 minutes, which she did. And as a consequence, um, WWD magazine actually did a front cover of this wonderful royal butterfly, which was subsequently bought by a collector and was then donated to the Smithsonian Institute and Jeffrey Post who was the curator at the time said he bought it or he accepted it because he wanted to preserve the future of vintage and look at Which the I back think is lovely of, look at the back of the piece absolutely beautiful piece uh, we also wanted you wanted to pick out in in out of the great 
number that are in your book, you picked out these two ladies to quickly Oh signal. yes, absolutely. And Niha Dani is, a, is an Indian jewelry designer and she actually has been showing in the Maclo Gallery in uh, New York uh, for the last two years. And her work is very abstract, so that's yes. why I wanted to uh, show her work. Yes. And she's using titanium and she's also using, here she's using a fire opal, wonderful fire opal. Um, and then Natalie and then, Castro. Uh, Natalie Castro, I had to include her work here because this is the first hologram in jewelry that I know of perhaps you know of one but she made yeah. this in 2006 and so it was really important to include these two people and of course I could have included so many more but we just don't have time and so here f we have um, Anna Corey and I love her work very sort of classic modernity it yes. really is that and you know it can be worn by men it can be worn by women it uh, you know and it can be worn in any way so many different ways it's what the young people are insisting on now they Absolutely. want to define for themselves how they wear who they are mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. obviously we're stopping but go keep going with us please we to go show you with four us. beautiful books but yes. we have a giant bibliography that Juliet passionately prepared which mm -hmm. will come to you tomorrow she's like can share with you it will come yeah. to you by mm -hmm. email tomorrow mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. some most of you already know yeah. but these four books we thought we would tell you about this the one by Emily Storer Emily Storer which is uh, about um, the Boston. women in America that we talked about absolutely and the Tadema Gallery London um, this is a book that's coming out um, in the next couple of weeks and it is a stunning book by Please Newell Smith. go for it by Sonia Neville Smith who was the owner of the Ta or is the owner of the Tadma gallery excuse me uh, Sonia and um, she is the owner and it has wonderful photographs of jewelry straight through from the end of the 19th and century to 1970s and, and so you can get lots of different uh, designers that you may have never heard of but they're beautifully photographed and if you want to find out about Tiaras to Tombstones of Maria Zimmerman. Get yes, that one. please. And then, and of course, Juliet's book. And then my book, where you find no. lots and lots of other um, jewelry designers who are as important and as good as those that we've shown today. Upcoming on the school, please join us on June 16th for a virtual guided tour of the exhibition with Sophie Lefebvre and Leonard Puy. Uh, that's online on June 16th. Silver Through Time, an examination continuing our impassioned chapter that we had just a few days ago on gold. Silver through time coming from our Hong Kong campus and register now and then please we're available for your questions right now or keep going with us on Instagram mm -hmm. I know a lot of you were participating in conversations with us even this morning on Instagram we're both there for you and we have some questions from Gislam we have first of all this is a very important thank you Gislam this is a very important exhibition do you know if there are plans for it to travel to other cities we do not we will check with Nicolas Gerbier and we will post that for you on Instagram. <laughs> uh, La, the brooch of Juliet. Who is it by? It's magnificent. Oh, it's a beautiful brooch. It's by Luce Camino. Who should have been in the lecture, who, but she's here. Yes, exactly. She's so here. we made and a she's choice. In your book. She's and a she's in my book. She's, uh, she does the most wonderful uh, plicajour enameling. And she also is very much inspired by astronomy as well as nature. And this piece pieces of a baobab tree and I adore baobab trees. For me it's one of the best pieces. Oh, the ba uh, B -A -B -O yes, yes. B-A-B-O-B. That's yes, right, yes, baobab yes. tree. And in actual fact, I was inspired by baobab trees by oh. somebody called Thomas Pakenham who wrote, who wrote and photographed the first book on trees in the early no, 1990s I just love and then it. I just love this and I love the tourmaline in this it's green tourmaline and um, with sunstone and with diamonds and it's just such a simple piece uh, may look a little elaborate but it's beautiful so here is the bibliography which you'll be receiving in the mail tomorrow but if you'd like to take a screenshot of it right now please, please do. do thank mm. you so much and we'll look forward to more questions going further yeah. on the Ecole mm -hmm. Instagram thank you it's been a pleasure being with you.